I'm pleased to be on a panel with uh, somebody with, from the Correctional Service. Uh, I'll provocatively state, however, that I'd be looking forward to find out what is it that the Correctional Service is actually correct. Uh, in my view, very little. And I completely agree the justice system is completely criminal and it should be studied uh, that way. So what do we see when we look at addictions? Many of the addicts in the downtown east side, the ones that the police spend their time chasing in the streets, are actually people who suffer from severe post-traumatic stress disorder. People self-medicate depression. Prozac is intended to increase the levels of serotonin. Cocaine also elevates serotonin level. People use cocaine to self-medicate depression. What dextrodine does, or Ritalin, is it elevates the level of dopamine. It actually calms down the hyperactive brain. What does cocaine do? What does nicotine do? Or crystal meth? Or caffeine? It elevates dopamine levels. People self-medicate ADHD. A good 30% of the people in jail in kids' country suffer from ADHD. That's why they're there. And when you do a brain scan on people who are experiencing a moment of emotional rejection, the same part of the brain will light up as if you stuck them with a knife. So the first question is not why the addiction, but why the pain. You want to know why the pain? I don't have a single female patient in the downtown east side who wasn't sexually abused as a child. That's why the pain. Because all the addiction substances actually are pain relievers. Cocaine is a local anesthetic. The men were also abused, if not sexually, then physically and emotionally and abandoned and neglected. The, the child who has got very limited means of surviving the trauma, one way to survive it is to deaden his emotions so because otherwise they're too overwhelming, he can't live with that much pain. Essentially what we're doing in this country with our so-called justice system is we're punishing people and jailing them for having been abused in the first place. And this is what the Canadian government is now spending $10 billion on building more jails for these people. While they're starving the social system of support for kids with learning disabilities, kids with family problems, kids with behavior problems, those services are being cut in the name of economic... What? But why do we have receptors for a derivative of a poppy plant? Well, of course, the answer is we don't. We have receptors for our own opiates. And there's a term for that. Our own opiates are called endorphins. Why do we have that? First of all, they're pain relievers, physical and emotional pain relievers. You have to have pain in this life. Pain is an important warning. You also have to have some internal pain relief because too much pain is unbearable. Number two, opiates are the reward and pleasure chemicals. So when you have an ecstatic, gleeful, an orgasmic experience, whether physical or, or emotional, uh, you have opiates. Now that's important for human life because without pleasure and reward, life becomes, as you can imagine, rather difficult. The third function of opiates is also the most important one. It can be summed up in one word, love. Without opiates, there's no experience of connection, attachment, and love. But that's not a luxury. In fact, love is a basic emotion without which life is impossible. Love is a basic emotion without which life is impossible. Now I want you to consider the following question. If your human being comes to the conclusion that without this particular substance, he or she will have no experience of pain relief, pleasure and reward, love and connection. Just exactly how are you going to take that away from them? Like putting up a billboard saying just say no? Same with the dopamine system. It's essential in motivation and incentive. So dopamine flows whenever you're seeking food, seeking a sexual partner, uh, exploring a novel environment. Food seeking will increase your dopamine levels by 50%, sex by 100%, a shot of cocaine by 300%, and crystal meth by 1200%. Imagine a kid then who comes to the intuitive conclusion that without that chemical, he has no experience of vitality, curiosity, aliveness, motivation, incentive. How are you going to take that away from him? By putting him in jail? By punishing him? There are a number of brain circuits involved in addiction. Impulse control is the capacity not to act on an impulse. I mean, when you do brain scans on drug addicts, that's not functioning well. So you're looking at people whose brains are actually not capable, relatively speaking, of withstanding the impulse. Because along with the many myths around addiction, one of them is that drugs are addictive. Well, clearly that's ridiculous. Most of you can go into a hospital and be given large quantities of morphine if you need it. And once the problem is dealt with, you're off the morphine and you barely even suffer withdrawal. Nicotine, food, sex, gambling, shopping, none of these are inherently addictive. In other, in other words, the addiction doesn't happen because of the substance. So the whole emphasis of the legal apparatus on inter interdicting the substance. Again, is completely beside the point. The real issue that I'm at, uh, raising here is what makes somebody susceptible. It turns out that the human brain, for the most part, develops under the impact of the environment. The person's stress response. It's when people are stressed that they go off and do something harmful 
to themselves, like eat too much or do a drug. The stress regulation mechanism of the child's brain is actually programmed because the dopamine receptors of the brain depend on the emotional states of the mother during pregnancy and early in life. The necessary condition for the development is the presence of non-stressed, non-depressed, emotionally available parenting caregiver, which is precisely what the addict never had. Uh, what's the other, uh, other child experience? Physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, theft of a parent, a rancorous divorce, violence in the family, addiction in the family, a parent being jailed. For each of these adverse childhood experiences, the risk of addiction in the adult goes up exponentially. So that by the time a male child has had six of these adverse childhood experiences, his risk of becoming a substance dependent addict is 4,600% greater than 46 fold increase based on childhood adversity. These are then the people whose brains are susceptible to lacking the systems fully developed when they meet a substance. It's the answer to the life's prayer. One sex trade worker, she said the first time I did heroin, it felt like a warm, soft hug. That's exactly what it was. It follows, therefore, that choice has nothing to do with it. It's all based on early experience. Genes have nothing to do with it. I shouldn't say nothing. There are genes that predispose to certain behaviors. Predispose, though, is not the same as predetermined. So the media loves these genetic stories. So as soon as somebody discovers the alcoholism gene, it goes on the cover of Time magazine. Three years later, it turns out that nobody discovered anything of the sort. That goes in some back little article on the violence genes. Kids who are violent are more likely to have a certain genetic variant. But it turns out, if these kids are brought up in families without violence or abuse, they're less likely to be violent than others. So it takes a combination of abuse and that gene to create the violence. Same with addiction. So genes don't determine, in fact, there's a whole science called epigenetics. The influences that override genetics are far more important than what the genes say themselves. So the genetic argument and the, the choice argument are simply cop-outs that prevent us from, from looking at what actually happens. Nothing genetic about it. There were addictive substances in North America prior to the coming of the Caucasians. Peyote, there was tobacco, there were even alcoholic spirits. There was no addiction. After that massive dislocation, historical horror that we all the aboriginals in North America. That's when addiction becomes their response to all the pain. So when I go to native communities now, the trauma now is entrenched in the generations. It's passed on multi-generation. Are, are destroyed when their lands are uh, taken away, when their movement is restricted. And then on top of that, when they experience generations of sexual abuse in the Christian-run residential homes. In Thunder Bay, there was a woman there from a reserve nearby. She said that in our reservation, there are 188 people, 133 are addicted. And it's simply a legacy of what happened to them and what continues to happen to them. Again, the assumption when it comes to uh, addictions is that these people have to hit rock bottom, they have to be punished and so on, and then they'll see the light. No, they don't. What's rock bottom for somebody who lives in the downtown inside with HIV, having lost everything? What's the rock bottom that they're going to have to hit? People don't need rock bottom, they need the very opposite. They have to have some confidence, some hope of victory. Victory is when you're treated like a human being, when you, you can look upon yourself with some compassion, when you realize that despite all that's happened to you and despite all that you've done, you're still a worthwhile human being. That's not the kind of victory our system gives people. The politicians thrive on creating enemies out of the most abused segments of the population. They thrive on creating fear of them. When you marginalize, ostracize, criminalize people, impoverish them, you're simply making sure that they're going to stay addicted. For the most part, the system is almost designed to keep people entrenched in misery. We're busy building jails. We have to get our priorities straight, right? The, the, British, go the British Columbia government cut programs for addicted youth in the north. <laughs> But it's got money to support Olympic athletes, and you tell me what our priorities are. Look, the, the use of, of psychoactive drugs has increased exponentially in the last several decades, including the children. In the States right now, there's 3 million kids on stimulant medications for ADHD. There are half a million kids on heavy-duty antipsychotics, not because they're psychotic, but because we don't know how to control their behaviors, because their environment has become so toxic for them that, that, that they simply are acting out all the time. There's this so-called biological psychiatry these days, giving drugs to change people's biology. But the understanding that the human psychology, that interpersonal neurobiology, that are the that the neurobiology, the biology of our nervous system depends very much on our relationships, that's completely ignored in medical practice. That's the reality. When you ask me how to change that, I have no idea. I mean, I, I can talk to her, I'm blue in the face. I'm not pessimistic about it in the long term. I think at some point sanity will prevail. But the short term outcome, it's very dismal as far as I'm concerned. When you look at the suicide rate, the school dropout rate, incarceration rate, and uh, our country is spending $11 billion in jail. What's needed, first of all, is a massive shift of attitude. You spend, I don't know how many billions on supposedly bringing freedom and justice and education to the Afghanis. Oh, what a joke. In other words, they would take a massive reorientation of priorities and a massive commitment to be a bit humble and, and, and honest about what we're doing and what we've done. We haven't even begun to address that. My message is not to wait for the government to do any of that, because 
it ain't gonna happen anytime soon. They're gonna have to confront the abuse in their own communities. Never mind, you know, without shame, without self-blame, but they're gonna have to confront it. Because without, without confronting the abuse question, they're never gonna confront the addiction question either. That's the first step. Uh, if we had that shift of perspective, I think the possibilities would be infinite. It would be infinite, be infinite, infinite, infinite.